let's let's let all the people listen to this very closely. Originally, our party uh, was called the Black Panther Party for Self Defense. Uh, the name for a long, long time we struggled. For a long, long time, for a long, long time we struggled. For a long, long time we struggled. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tracy Matthews. I'm the executive director of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. And we'd like to thank you and welcome you all to our event tonight. The world is a child's classroom, lessons from the Black Panther Party's Oakland Community School. I'm going to turn the mic over to our moderator, Ms. Sherry Keels, who is an associate professor in comparative human development at the University of Chicago. Thanks, Tracy. Really appreciate that. And um, as Tracy just noted, we welcome you all to this event tonight and this opportunity to learn from this excellent set of panelists. I'm just going to do a bit of a broad introduction to where we are today and um, a note from the various hosts and organizations that have put this event together before turning it over to our panelists. And I'm just, you know, in this Zoom world that we're in, switching between screens, so I'm not gonna be able to see you for a moment. So as Tracy noted, the world is a child's classroom, lessons from the Black Pan Panther Party's Oakland Community School is the title of our event tonight. This is the first in a series of virtual programs focusing on themes of Black radical pedagogy curated by Emily Hooper Lanza and Tracy Matthews, who you just heard from. This accompanies the exhibition by Carrie Mae Weems' A Land of Broken Dreams, which is an initiative of toward common cause, art, social change, and the MacArthur Fellows Program at 40. This is on view now through December 12th, at the Riva and David Logan Center for the Arts. So the co-presenters that I would like to thank for bringing this event together are the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture at the University of Chicago, especially Beth Awano, Tierra Kirkpatrick and Tracy Matthews. Logan Center Community Arts, especially Emily Hooper Lanza. Logan Center Exhibitions, especially Alyssa Brubaker. 
and the Riva and David Logan Center for the Arts, especially Lee Fain. The video that was playing at the opening of the program was the Black Panther Party's 10 point program from Carrie Maylene's A Land of Broken, Broken Dreams. This video was produced by Bob Studio. The following opening photo montage was the BPP Survival Program Compilation, produced by Angela D. LeBlanc Ernest, who was one of our panelists this evening. So what we're going to do now as we begin to move into the program is have brief presentations by each of our panelists, whom I'll introduce shortly. Then I will um, ask just a couple of questions. Do put your questions into the chat. I will be monitoring the chat to try to um, identify and highlight some important questions to ask as we open up. And also, as I'm sure you noted, because you needed to check in, that we are being recorded um, in this session. So with that, I want to introduce our panelists. So um, the first is Erica Huggins. And as you will note from um, these bios I'm about to read, this really is um, a multi-talented group of panelists uh, that have done an exciting diversity of work in their careers thus far. Erica Huggins is an educator, human rights activist, poet, and former BPP leader and political prisoner who has used her life experiences in service to community for more than 50 years. Huggins served as director of the BPP's Oakland Community School from 1973 to 1981 and managed HIV AIDS volunteer and education programs from 1990 to 2004. She has also supported, supported innovative mindfulness programs for women and youth in schools, jails, and prisons. Huggins was professor of sociology and African-American studies from 2008 to 2015 at the Peralta Community College District. And from 2003 to 2011, she was professor of women's and gender studies at San Francisco State University and California State University East Bay. As a racial equity learning lab facilitator for World Trust Educational Services, Huggins curates conversations focused on the individual and collective work of cultivating equity in all areas of our daily lives. Additionally, she facilitates workshops on the benefit of spiritual practice in sustaining social change. And now Angela LeBlanc Ernest is an independent scholar and independent filmmaker whose work focuses on American history post-1965 with an emphasis on the modern black freedom struggle. She was founding director of the BPP's research project at Stanford University and has focused on ensuring that the party's history includes the contributions of women, the impact of gender, and the organization's community survival programs. The founder and, curate and current director of the OCS project, LLC, LeBlanc Ernest is creating a documentary about the Open Community Schools one of the BPP's longest lasting of those programs. She holds degrees from Harvard University and Stanford University. She's a co-founder of the Intersectional BPP History Project, whose focus is to highlight the role of women and gender in the BPP. And I think that was a bit of a, a, a repeat. I just wanna close by saying, um, she is currently also um, BPP community partner with and co-leader of the Oakland Community School Community Archive Activism and Storytelling at the University of California Irvine Humanities Center. And now Gail Asali Dixon is an ordained minister who was born in Berkeley and raised in Oakland, California. Dixon became a BPP member in Seattle in 1970. In 1972, she and other party members joined the Oakland 
a base of operations campaign, the focus of which was to take over the city's government, make it responsive to the community's needs, and ideally replicate that model across the country. Dixon, who is an artist, soon joined the graphic art department at the BPP newspaper as its only female artist. Shortly after transferring to, to the Oakland Community School, BPP's Oakland Community School in 1974, she created their logo. After leaving the party in 1976, she returned to school to finish her art degree and she continues to hone her craft and personal artistic style. She has been a substitute teacher in the Oakland Unified School District. Her previous community projects include an elementary school and working with the Golden Gate Valley Library, the African American Museum and Library at Oakland, the Oakland Museum of California, and the DeYoung Museum. She recently was a consultant on the mural commissioned by Jilly Krista Vest honoring the women of the Black Panther Party. And then we have Gregory Lewis. He's an, he is an Oakland, California native and the son of two former rank and file members of the BPP party. He was one of a small class of original students, most of them children of Panthers who attended the Oakland Community School from its inception in the 1970s. Lewis and his family remained in the BPP until his parents' abrupt departure from the organization in 1979. As a student at San Francisco State University, he reconnected with his Panther roots and was reminded of the power of the movement that had shaped his life. He has been writing and sharing his story ever since and is currently working on a memoir, Power to the Children, Writing from the Life of a Panther Pub. Lewis holds degrees from SF, San Francisco State University and New College of California School of Law. He has worked as a mentor, a paralegal, an adjunct instructor, and a coach, and is currently the varsity wrestling coach at Albany High School. He is a proud father of three grown children and has been known to play the guitar and sing his special brand of, a brand of blues and funk for family and friends. So as I stated at the outset, and as can be seen from these bios, this is a multi-talented, diverse group of panelists here for you tonight. So moving back over where I can now see you guys again, we're going to go into our panelists. I believe I'm going to invite Erica to open. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Sherry. That, all of your introductions were so beautiful. I was just riveted to listen to them. And I want to give a special thanks to the stellar team of women, along with Tracy Matthews and Emily, who made this event possible, working tirelessly on details and all the things, all the heavy lifting behind the scenes. So thank you. And thank you to my fellow panelists, Angela, Asali, and Gregory. Thank you. I just want to set a tone. Um, the BPP began, the Black Panther Party, began in 1966 as the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And it rose out of the continuum of movements for freedom and dignity of Black people, of African people, in the United States from 1619 until now. A continuum, a river of movements. The Black Panther Party didn't descend out of the sky. It came from the needs of people. 
And as we talk about self-defense, we're not talking about a physical something. We're talking about the ability to meet the needs of people by defending their health care, by uplifting their spirits, by feeding them, clothing them, housing them. And every movement that preceded the Black Panther Party brought it into being, every single one. And every movement since then is a part of this continuum. All power to the people, which was a slogan that went global in every language possible, was a reminder, not a threat. And our motto, the Black Panther Party motto, was to serve the people, body and soul. So our focus for today is based in the amazing Carrie Mae Weems' wonderful exhibit, Toward a Common Cause. And what is that cause? To respect and invest everything in all human beings, no matter their location, their identities, and their proximity to dominant cultural norms. We know, because we're part of black and brown communities, many of us, that there is no monolithic black community or brown community. It's vast and broad and deep and of value. So I, I, I love seeing the, the slides that Angela put together, which describe to some degree the Black Panther Party's community survival programs. There were 65 of them that were easily replicated and were around the globe and then are being replicated now. And today we're going to focus on one of them, but I just want to lift up the People's Free Medical Clinics, the food programs, cooperative housing programs, the seniors program, a teen program, the busing to prisons program. As you listen to this short part of the long list, you'll see how needed they are now and many wonderful people are taking care of those needs. The Black Panther Party's educational programs um, started with conversations that party members were having with high school students in, in maybe 1966 and 67. And then there came a time when party members wanted to have a place to educate or re-educate their own children, their sons and daughters. And of course, seeing this at the children's houses, which were in Oakland, um, as an example, they were throughout the country, but the ones in Oakland, I can remember, the community said, we want our children there. Can our children be a part of your great little house? And then we ran out of space for all the children. And so we moved into the, another community in Oakland, in East Oakland, and opened up a huge house. And once again, there were sons and daughters of party members there, but also the neighborhood children, both black and brown and white, came. It was called the Intercommunal Youth Institute. And in 1973, a grandmother went to Huey Newton and said, let's, uh, let's have a dedicated school site. Let's invest in the children that way. And so a corporation was formed, the school site, an old church was bought. And in the school year 1973-74, the Oakland Community School opened. And why does it have that name? Because as Huey aptly put it, 
Who's going to remember Intercommunal Youth Institute? Let's have a name that the people can remember. And so it was. So Asali and Gregory and Angela can tell you more about the Oakland Community School. And thank you very much for listening. Sherry? Hi, yes, thank you very much for that. Good evening, everybody. Um, first, I just wanna um, echo Erica and just thank the entire team and co-sponsors of this event. The Oakland Community School occupies a very special place in the hearts and minds of students, teachers, staff, parents and community supporters and just people who lived in the community. And so for the past 28 years, I've been blessed. It's been an honor for me to have the opportunity to work with so many former um, BPP members and OCS participants and trying to piece together the school's history and that work still continues today. As Erica mentioned, at its October 1966 founding, only 55 years ago, the Black Panther Party's organizational charter included a demand for an education system that reflected the true history of Black people. The Panthers developed a variety of programs to build the community with educational institutions. And so Erica mentioned just the, the school visits where they would just have conversations um, to prompt um, thinking and critical thought, local tutoring, liberation school, teaching at the free breakfast for school children programs, which were all across the country. Uh, they also host the GED programs, the Child Development Center, and the Intercommunal Youth Institute, which was the earliest iteration of what would become the Oakland Community School. So slide four is actually uh, just a graphic basically of what Erica just explained to us in terms of the history and movement um, specifically from 1971 as the Intercommunal Youth Institute to um, through 1982. So because she already explained that transition, we can move on to the next slide. So in the five minute clip you're about to watch, Several OCS participants I've interviewed for my documentary film in progress reflect on the question, why should people know about the Oakland Community School? The most important thing to know about the Oakland Community School was that it was ordinary people with an intention. We weren't education scholars. We had scholars come and visit. <laughs> um, very few, when the school started, there weren't any professional teachers. We weren't certified. We hired people who were certified to teach, but we weren't initially. Um, I think it's just really important for people to understand that you have to have a strong intention and a willingness, a willingness to do whatever it's going to take. It, and that's and that's what it took. It, it wasn't anything more than that, you know. Of course you have to raise money. Of course you have to get the teachers. Of course you have to get a place. Of course, of course, of course. However, how do you start? You start with an intention that this is what we're going to do. And we're not going to stop until this is accomplished. And it's not even, you're not even thinking about stopping. You're not thinking that, that there are gonna be roadblocks. Of course there are gonna be roadblocks. Is anybody gonna to wanna to help you? Maybe not, probably not. Are people gonna work against you? Absolutely. What's your intention? You want something to happen? You have enough people that say, we really want this to happen. So then start making it happen, start doing it. They started out feeding the children breakfast in San Francisco. I think that must have been the seed to, sh to show that our children in public schools were not getting their needs met. 
they weren't getting good they weren't eating like they should and they they you know their their needs weren't getting met so there needed to be an Oakland Community School there needs to be an Oakland Community School now the Oakland Community School was a direct result of flipping education on its head if you remember, there was this intersection that happened because the party had been really pushing on this point of what was going to be the Oakland Public Schools. We developed a community education program that worked. Um, it touched the students' hearts. It touched our minds. It helped us grow. We also learned how to cry. run and jump and embrace each other. I mean, it's about the humanity, right? It's about the life that we all aspire to live, that we want to live. When we have children, we want them to have all of these things to nurture them, to guide them through. And the school had that. The curriculum was healing. The students and the teachers learned together. Teachers weren't threatened by students. The teachers allowed us to challenge them, and they weren't threatened by our challenges. And there was a lot of love. So the school was so good that the students didn't want to go home because they felt so loved. Well, I thought about what Kalita Smith, who's now an actress, said about the her experience at the school as a child. I asked her to recall what stood out to her about the Oakland Community School. It was the same question I asked everybody. She said, if I came in there with my hair looking all crazy, braids going every which way, somebody would walk up with a brush and a comb and say, sweetheart, come on, we'll redo your braids. She said, if I came in sad because something was happening at home that I didn't know how to deal with, all of a sudden somebody would walk up and give me a hug. And when I had a skill or a talent that I was too shy to talk about, because she said, I used to be shy, um, somebody would give me some information or a book or something so I could pursue it. I said, so what would you say? My next question was after hearing all that. What would you say was the benefit for you of Oakland Community School? And again, she's like, what? What kind of crazy question is that? Oakland Community School made me the woman I am today. And I said, and what would you change about it? And she goes, another crazy question. The only thing I would change is that, Erica, it wouldn't have closed and every child would have what I had. One of the reasons OCS was so transformative is precisely because the needs of the children were centered and the school maintained a close connection with parents and the community. And the mottos that you see on the screen inspired everything the educators students and parents strove to achieve and those were used uh, throughout the history of the Oakland Community School. On the next screen you see some of the subjects they learned and it's important to know that they weren't just insulated outside the school building. They participated in um, spelling and math competitions. They competed with youth in other schools at city <coughs> competitions and in 1976 a group of 10 year old OCS students even presented a clean water treatment science project at the Western Region Black Engineers Conference um, intended for professionals. Performing arts was central to their OCS experience. Not only was it their opportunity to learn songs and dance, but the content was crucial. The instructors were there to help students with the plays and skits that the students wrote themselves. The topics ranged from African culture and history to Black history and all other movements. They performed comedic pieces as well as serious pieces. And the performances were the students' opportunities to learn 
as well as teach the community members who were in the audience. Additionally, they learned martial arts, practiced yoga and meditation, and had a peer-based justice committee for resolving issues. The children were provided after school clubs as well. They camped in local forests, visited museums, the Port of Oakland and competed against others in martial arts and music, walking away winners. Carol Granison referenced the process in the clip you view. It was an evolutionary process and the result of learning as they worked. It was on the job training. Not only was it a training ground for students, but also was a training ground for the parents, teachers, and administrators. And it wasn't uncommon for a parent to enroll a student as Jeanette Keyes did. She enrolled her son in the school and then she volunteered and then she became a teacher at the school. So at the end of each documentary film interview, I asked the same question. What are five words that describe your OCS experience? In 2019, I plugged those words into a word map generator for 50 of the interviews and the top five words used to describe their experience were love, community, education, compassion, and strength. OCS provides a model for how education can be designed to meet each child's whole needs physical, intellectual, psychological, emotional, and spiritual. Community and family were central to this model. One's economic class, race, or family composition was not important to who worked at the school and who attended the school. Teachers, students, and volunteers were from all class, cities, and backgrounds. Love for the children was the focus. In addition, during the after school hours, the building was the Oakland Community Learning Center and was the site for the administration of over dozens of community programs. These programs were administered by the nonprofit EOC service. There's so much history in community building that occurred at that building itself. Here you see a 1976 image of the school, a mural that was painted on the back of the school next to the playground and a current image of the, of the building where the school was located for nine years. With its advanced approaches to educating children, it's easy to forget that OCS was an elementary level school. The people in this photo are not at a high school reunion. They are gathering with each other to remember their elementary level experience. That is something worthy of reflection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela, for that presentation. Um, really great to see that historical perspective. And Angela, it was great to see you, um, for you to set the context and see you in the documentary also for additional um, context. Um, this has been great. And Erica, also, as you have set things up, and then also, again, to see you give that additional perspective. I believe we are now turning to, I have correct, to Gregory for your perspective um, as a Panther Cub. Okay, um, uh, I guess I'll, I can start out at the beginning, but I do wanna say uh, thank you to Erica and to Angela and also to Gail, but to all of the teachers and mentors who have kind of brought me here from where I was in my initial iteration as a, a, a Panther cub, if you will, or as someone born into the Black Panther Party. That's how I like to, uh, how I like to define it. Um, it's really uh, incredible to me that at now 50, 50, <clears throat> 50 years old, I can still get really emotional when I hear um, Erica talk and when I uh, see images from uh, really the place that birthed me, I mean, from the performances that you saw and everything else. So just by way of introduction, I was essentially born into the Black Panther Party. Uh, my mother, uh, at the time I was born, she was a 17 year old single mom in East Oakland. And my uh, father, Greg Sr. was a then a member of the Black Panther Party, one of the original fledgling members of the party before before he left um, soon after my mother and I joined. Um, so 
from its inception, from my inception in 1970, um, through uh, you know the first nine years of my life, I was in the Black Panther Party, as I like to call it. And uh, a part of the duties of being in the Black Panther Party before you even became a student or went to school was you lived a life where your parents were uh, being followed by the FBI, if you will. Uh, we didn't believe that at that time because we thought it was far-fetched when our parents would tell us these things. But this also meant we had to bond together because often our parents were not with us um, on any, any given number of night. And we thankfully had other parents to pick up the slack um, for the purpose of the struggle, if you will. So out of that, you know, backdrop, um, you know, my mother came from a very sort of religious, traditional Southern background, which really objected to a lot of uh, what these crazed folks with long afros were doing in the streets of Oakland as they saw them on the TV and in the local police blotters. Um, so, um, so we were essentially alone in the Black Panther Party. That was our family. That was my family from, from inception. And, um, and the school ultimately, as it became built, became our real sanctuary, our real sanctuary um, <laughs> away from the United States government, if you will. Um, and, and, and the genesis of all of that was this amazing program that was created that I was able to benefit from um, that really gave me a, an avenue to not only communicate what I had already experienced, it's, you know, at such a young age, you know, by the time I was two or three, I'd, I'd seen quite a bit. Uh, and to sort of synthesize all that and to be able to create an, an environment where, um, where we developed an amazing thirst for education because um, it started with books, it started with reading and um, you know, as I was told later, as the, as the school developed, um, it just was a natural, really seamless conversion uh, from my life to where the school was, was my home. Um, and the model, the reflective model that I often reflect on is that there was a seamless transition between my home life and school life. So, you know, when we, those of us who were Panther Cubs, especially initially, we also lived in uh, what we call dormitories, I guess, dorms. Um, as I've gotten older, I've talked, with, I've talked with some wealthy white kids, friends of mine who are like, yeah, I went to boarding school when I was here. I'm like, and they kind of equate it to a boarding school. But uh, as I said, uh, the government was, was also chasing us. So it was a little different. Um, but, you know, our days started together and ended together. You know, we, we, we woke up, I, I, one of my first you know, memories is the age of five, four to five, uh, and we all lived in this dorm on Adeline Street in Berkeley. And it was this, this upstairs flat. And I think it was four, four to five boys, maybe six boys in one room and six girls in the other room. All of us you know, were the same age. One of the students was Erica's, Erica's daughter, Mai, Mai Huggins, who's, who's my age. And um, uh, Geronimo Clark and all, you know, all of these best friends that I had at school, we lived a life in a dorm where we woke up at six o'clock every morning. We all knew our routine. Uh, go to the bathroom, single file line, go down the stairs, get on the bus, go to school. And all through that moment, there was never a moment where anyone was like, I don't want to go to school today. <laughs> there was literally never uh, any kind of moment like that, because again, that was our sanctuary. It really was our sanctuary. And, you know, we'd file down and then we'd get on our bus, the school bus, the yellow, yellow school bus, and they would drive us over this little ramp from Berkeley to, uh, to East Oakland. And um, there were a couple funny times where we'd pass, there was, a, there was a police station down below on the path and we'd always kind of shout at the police station, police station, because we just identified that they were there. <laughs> there was no, there was no other, other meaning to it other than we know. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, we file into our playground at our school and it's, it was especially the, the final iteration of the big, the converted church that 
was really had this big expansive playground that we just, you know, we, we got off the school bus and we got into the play, play, playground and we started our day with exercise. We started our days with about, I, I would guess it was 15 to 30 minutes of 25 jumping jacks, however many push-ups, however many sit-ups. That was really how we started our day. And from my perspective, that started a lifelong love of exercise and, you know, being fit and taking care of your body because it felt, uh, it always felt so good to start our days off like that. And one of the te one of the teachers would instruct us in the playground. And then after that, the next thing we go, be like, you know, what's for breakfast? Are we going to have bacon? Are we going to have eggs? Is it going to be powdered eggs? You know, what, what was next? Uh, and then after our exercises, we file into what we, our cafeteria and, um, and we'd all have breakfast together, basically, <laughs> you know, we would all have breakfast together and we'd still talk and, you know, sometimes we'd be a little louder than other times and, you know, other times we'd be more reflective, but we were all together. And this was a good, you know, hour or two before school even started. So, you know, really that foundation for our, for our day was shaped uh, every, every single morning for the first nine years of my life, uh, Monday through Friday. And, you know, after breakfast, after everything, I mean, you guys have, most people have heard this before, but yes, no one went hungry, but going hungry wasn't even, it, it wasn't even an idea. We just knew we had each other and we knew that, um, yeah, we weren't going to go hungry. We never had that feeling, you know? Were it any other situation with my mother being a single mom and the way Oakland, the way many uh, places don't offer services, uh, would have been a completely different um, situation. And I recognize that. And then, so that was our day, that was our foundation. And then we file up to our different, our different classrooms. And I think some folks and some educators have talked about the way that we were, I didn't realize this until much later when I read Erica's works and, other people that we were placed in the classrooms according to our, our ability. So I had, my mother ended up becoming an English teacher and I just, books, I just escaped, I just read all the time. And I wrote, I read and I wrote. And so, you know, I went to, I went to maybe my English class was a little more advanced than some of my other students because I was reading, I was such, a, at such a high level, but, you know, math, I was usually with my age group. And so forth. And so our days were spent going from classes to where we would not only have the bonds that we shared from growing from our age group where we live, but we actually developed bonds with other kids in class who had similar abilities to us. Maybe they were older, maybe they were younger, but we were all in the same class together and developing relationships along the way. And um, we absolutely benefited from a dynamic group of young uh, educators uh, who were uh, again, you know, when you're five, six, seven, and eight, you don't really realize how young uh, James Mott and Erica Huggins and even my mother, Pamela, Pamela Perkins, uh, how young they actually were uh, because we had a lot of energy <laughs> and they had to, and, and, you know, they had to, they were able to, they were able to deal with us and, and keep us on task, if you will. Um, and uh, I could, I could really, really wax, wax on and on about the educational model and my experience and how it's, it really helped shape my life in so many ways, not only from being a student to being a professional, to being a coach, but also to being a parent uh, to, my, to my children, being a father, uh, being a responsible, um, loving, caring, responsible father comes from the foundation of, of the Black Panther Party, of the school, of uh, the mentors who really, really showed me that um, love takes many forms and, and all it does is just helps you grow and become a better person. And when, you know, I, I'm often reflective of, you know, the little seeds who don't get that, that water that I got as a little kid to let me sprout into this, you know, person that I am today. And it's, it's, it's one of the continual reflections that I have and that's why I, I do coach and I do mentor and I do connect with um, with 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 young men and and women on a on a level of understanding that everyone did not get what I what I got, you know. Everyone did not get that, and there's a certain responsibility of 
being able to share that um, and to share that experience. And um, so it's, 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 it's very emotional for me sometimes because it, it really is a part of my, um, it's a part of my truth. And when I go back to those times and realize how dynamic uh, the, the, the folks who came before me and who are present with us now uh, and the sacrifice they made, when I see Carol Granison, who was my English teacher, say, you just do it. <laughs> this is how sometimes we, <laughs> they educated us, if you will. You know, you can talk about it. You can think about all the ways in which you can't do it or think about how you can do it. And it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's one of those really, really good, good lessons and reminders uh, for just being a part of this panel and kind of sharing, sharing with you all through this. Thank you very much, um, Gregory. That was, I was right there listening and thinking and wishing that I had been in your classrooms and in your school. So um, thank you for that addition to helping us contextualize this. I wanna remind um, our participants to put questions in the chat. Um, so we will be looking at those and thinking about those as we go on. And invite, um, who's now on the screen, Gail Asali Dixon to share with us next. Greetings everyone. And I just want to thank you all uh, for inviting me to be on this panel. And um, I just also wanna say that I feel honored and I love the exhibit. Well, I would like to affirm all that has been said earlier. It's really not much for me to say, but I would like to say, uh, I, what, I do, what I would do is I would like to add a couple of um, stories from my brief time as um, an Oakland Community School preschool teacher. One story is that there was um, one child um, in my class who didn't chew her food well at all. And she ate very fast. And as a result, she often threw up her food at our communal preschool lunch table. But I want you to know in affirming what everyone has said before me, that as a class, as a class of children, preschool children, we worked to settle her down and encourage her to take her time while eating. There was no judgment, just service. And I, don't, I can't describe for you what's in my memory in terms of how the children would take care of. I mean, they would sit next, nobody was like, oh, I'm not gonna sit next to her. They would sit next to her, you know, and they would embrace her. So that's one example. Another example is one day, our class went on a field trip to Coit Tower over in San Francisco. And after our return to the classroom, the children laid down to take a nap. And while they were napping, I pulled out some butcher paper and unrolled some butcher paper and really um, just recaptured the field trip with some lines and stick figures. And, um, then I posted the paper uh, mural for them to see on the wall. And um, when they woke up, uh, we sat down and we went over the field trip together. It wasn't just me retelling, as a matter of fact, I didn't retell the story. I just pointed to the mural and asked them to retell the story. And so all the kids participated in retelling the story. And after they thoroughly reviewed their field trip, I encouraged the children to tell their parents about their trip. Now, there was another little girl in the classroom. She talked in a very sing-song voice. 
And it was very, very difficult to understand her words. But when this little girl's mother came to pick her up, she ran over and she grabbed her mother and she pulled her over to the mural and she started pointing to the mural and telling her everything that happened on that field trip. And the reason why this memory is so vivid to me, I mean, it's such a memory for me, is that because that little girl, nobody could understand her words, but when she retold that story, her mother and I looked at each other because we understood every word very clearly that she said. We taught our children with lots of love, as everybody has testified to, communal caring values, as well as how to process and experience, how to process and experience and engage all their senses. The Oakland Community School created an environment that gave the children permission to love themselves as well as others and to think for themselves. Thank you very much. That is a fabulous way to sum up this panel and all of the contributions that you guys have made collectively and everyone else that you've worked with. Um, clearly, it took a lot of people and a lot of energy to bring that school together and to support all of the children that you, um, I would say educated, but nurtured really um, over the years um, that you, yeah, that you had a feat is what I would say um, for that school and the program that you did. Thank you. Thank you. So um, as we're transitioning to the community conversation portion, um, I want to center the voice and experience of one other OCS participant, and her name is Alicia Keys. And she's actually the daughter of Jeanette Keys, who uh, was one of the persons in the video that we watched earlier. Um, once the pandemic shut down everything in early 2020, I had to decide whether I would stop working on the documentary project and interviewing folk because I couldn't be on location again with them anymore or whether I should um, use modern technology and continue capturing those stories, which are so important. And I decided to transition and do Zoom interviews. So during the during that particular interview, the former student sang a rendition of the Oakland Community School school song, which had been written in 1976 by Elaine Brown, who was um, the only Black Panther Party chair, female chair, chairperson. And what many people didn't don't know is that she's also a very accomplished songwriter and musician and singer. And so she took the time to write a song that was specifically for the children. And they would sing this song at graduations. Um, and the other thing to remember is that the song Alicia is singing, she's singing it 43 years after her graduation. She graduated from OCS in 1977, meaning she just transitioned to um, public school. Um, and so, yeah, I just want you to listen to the words and um, just feel how she remembers it. Mm -hmm. can do anything because anything is possible, you see. We can. Destroy all sorrow and make a brighter day. We can save the world and make peace like it should be. And we can do. Woo! Tears. Mine too. 
I love that song so much. It was always so inspirational. I couldn't wait to get up on that stage and sing that song. It meant so much to me. It, meant, it showed me that um, the possibilities for me and my future and how I can be, I can help change the world. You know, it was, yeah, you just, you felt so um, important. I love that song. And I would cry every time, every time, even watching it watching other other graduates sing the song like oh you know and then when i it was my turn to sing I, of course i've cried thank you very much that was excellent so i want to um I was just uh, making sure I lost my screen there. Um, I think if it's, if you will allow me to open um, questions by asking, and I mean, it, it, it may seem like um, a question that's, that doesn't need to be asked, but I, but I think still would be given that it is, it is um, that the school is coming out of, is, of, is an extension of the community aspects of the Black Panther Party and that sense of community, the need to, um, the sense of community in the, the party itself, as well as a commitment to serving the broader community. Um, when you, for most of us, we experience education as a very competitive, um, endeavor and from what I hear from you guys in the in your presentations and that was in the clips from the documentary as well as clear in the two students um, in Gregory and this is student in this last clip it was not that competitive environment that most of us know and associate with our educational experiences. Were there any concerns? Um, was there at all any first any um, was, there was it even a discussion about um, whether this was going to be uh, whether competition and ranking students and all those types of things were going to be part of the way things went in the school? And was there any concerns about how students would transition when they needed to, um, for high school and things like that, transition into the regular uh, public school environment? Can I just jump in really quickly? And I'm gonna jump in and jump out because I think I've heard Gregory speak to this before as a student, but what I will say is there was some fierce competition in the classroom setting because the children were taught and taught in an engaging way and encouraged to ask questions and ask questions of the teachers and challenge ideas and thoughts. Um, it was a community of that sense, but there's, so there's more to it. Um, and you should also know that students left OCS and transitioned to public schools. And when they tested in, they were testing at grade levels that were two and three grade levels above the other students. So I'd like to transition to Gregory because he had classroom experience. And so I think he can speak to that more. Oh, okay. It wasn't letting me unmute myself for some reason. All right, we're back on. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would be also be interested in hearing Erica's perspective on how competitive we were, because I think it's sometimes fun to to think about it in 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 my in my light, which is that we were absolutely highly driven uh, in in and outside of the classroom, really all as, aspects of our of our lives. I mean, we would often challenge each other to who could figure out the best uh, algebra problem, you know, when you're four, when you're what, six, seven, eight years old. Um, we were really, really high achievers. And there was a very um, significant moment before we left, before my, my, my mother, before we took us out of the Black Panther Party, is we, we, for the first time, took a standardized test. And I believe it must have been around 1979 or something like that. And there was this big rush by all the teachers to get us these uh, number two pencils and to uh, get everything right so that we'll, we basically, as the kids would say today, we were going to crush this exam. You know, that, that, that was the goal. And so we actually had, you know, this was a very seminal moment of, you know, getting out the books and learning how to bubble in your name and, and do all this. It, it, they kind of, I mean, it was pretty brilliant, but they turned it into a fun project for us and it was something different. Uh, that 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 then we had ever experienced, and um, ultimately, you know, the short version of the story. When I left the uh, the Black Panther Party at the age of nine or ten, I was I, I my scores were at high school level, but I ended up going into the fifth grade when I should have been in the third grade, and I ended up graduating high school when I was uh, well, I was fit. My birthday's in January, like Erica's, but I was fifteen at the start of my senior year in high school, and. In, in many ways, I was far academically ahead of those students who were in my graduating class. Um, so I, I think that there was ultimately a little push by the teachers for us to uh, be able to do standardized type uh, learning and education and model. But the, really the, the, the foundation of you know, self-awareness and confidence that they instilled in us kind of put us ahead of our peers in public schools in my experience. Does that cover a little bit of the question? Okay. Okay, sorry, I could not unmute there um, for a second. What would be fabulous if Erica and um, Gail could speak to is how you created that culture of of rigor and I'm gonna, so I'm going to say a competition without competition. So in the sense that they were competing for high standards and high grades, but not competing against each other um, in a way that doesn't allow you to build community. So how did you do both of those things? Erica, you're muted. Sorry about that, it muted itself. There, was, there wasn't the dilemma of A or B or C or F because we didn't have grades. We had little narratives about how students were doing for their, for their parents. We asked every child in the school, and Gregory probably remembers this, investigate. Before you decide upon something, investigate it, meaning use critical thinking skills and also find the facts. Now, there was no internet, but they were able to find facts by talking to each other. So. Competitive is probably needs another definition for what we did because it really was a game of ideas and imagination and understanding and budding wisdom. So um, when, when I sent students who would come in to me asking questions, or with assumptions, I would say, go and investigate and come back. And that was part of the model of the school, not for the tiny children, but for the, the, the 
first through fifth and sixth graders. So when we, I smiled when Gregory was talking about the standardized testing because we did it intentionally because people doubted that our school was for real, that we were really educating children because there was so much love and joy in that building. But you see, as Gregory just wonderfully said it, it was the foundation of that love and that valuing and allowing for children to just be that allowed them to feel that the tests were like a game and they won. They won. Asali, anything? Okay, actually, I do have a couple of things. Um, you know, I'm a, a substitute teacher uh, now, and um, I, I heard you, you see you spoke the key word, standardized test. And what I noticed today that um, the children, they're taught to that test. That's right. Versus how we taught the kids to how to think, you know, and... They can, and they wind up graduating and being, I'm not graduating, wind up being two years ahead of everybody else. So that that's one thing. Um, the other thing I was thinking about, like you said, competitive. Now I was with the baby, you know, and they, uh, we, we were, matter of fact, people would come in and comment, you guys are like a family. So I guess, I guess if there's competition going on, it's whatever goes on in every family, you know. Not like you see out here, you're going to be, you're going to flunk if you don't get to a certain level or something like that, you know. But we we were literally family. Like I was telling you about the little girl. We sat down as a class and we decided how we were going to, you know, that we were going to work with her and how we were going to work with her. And it, it was, that's how it happened. The other thing is, I'll tell you, I have one little story of competition that I didn't plan to say, talk about, but there was two children in my classroom. They were actually, I, I think they were uh, half brothers. One was from France and he spoke nothing but French. The other was America and he spoke nothing but English. And so they were uh, playing ball, you know, and Yvonne, the, uh, the one that spoke English, he would say, um, uh, he would throw the ball to his to his brother from France, and his brother would keep the ball and want to go out and, and would be mad and want to fight him. You know, it's like, no, this is my ball. And so they struggled for a minute, and then finally uh, Yvonne came over to me, and he said, he won't share, you know. And so I took out my little pad and pencil. You know, when what the teachers did, like uh, Carol said, we had to have intention. So you use whatever your skill set was and your creativity or whatever, you know. So I took out my little pad and pencil and I drew the picture and I, I told uh, uh, the the guy from France, the little boy from France, I told him, this is what you, this is how you do this. You play the game and the ball goes back and forth and blah, blah. He said, oh, ah, and he said something in French. And then they went over and played. You know, sometimes children just have to be shown a better way, you know. And so that, that's all I have to say on that. I would say what you just said, sometimes, the adults need to be shown a better way. That's right. What you just said for all of us, kids, adults, community need to be shown a better way. So what I would like to do in terms of wrapping this up is asking if each of you could say something around what would you wanna to see today? What of any recommendations, any suggestions, any ideas, 
or any initiatives that any of us should be looking towards investing our energies in that would enable and support the kinds of um, the intention, not only the intention, but what you actually did, what you created um, with that school in our communities, um, in our educational system today. What are your marching orders for us? Well, let's see. What, like I said, I, I've been a substitute teacher, not very long before COVID did its thing. But um, what I saw was a lot of pressure on teachers and stress on teachers. You know, it, um, I'm probably not using the right language, but, uh, you know, they had certain things have to be accomplished by a certain time. And, and um, it's just, to me, it's a lot of pressure on the teachers. And I think the system has to be overhauled, changed, eliminated, and a more loving, caring, community-oriented system to take its place. I don't know if that's clear, but the, the spirit of it has to be in there. And I don't see that spirit in, in there. It's a lot of, you know, pressure and stress and children are not, children are, up, I, I, you know what, I was in this one school and this little girl, First of all, she looked like she was in the 12th grade. She was in the sixth or seventh or eighth grade. And I said, baby, what, you, what are you doing in here? And she said, um, my teacher told me to leave and come into the office. I said, why is that? Because I was screaming. Why were you screaming in the classroom? She said, because I just wanted to get out. I mean, contrast that with what uh, uh, Gregory was saying about kids looking forward to go to school and kids around the same age, you know, looking for excuses to not be in classroom. Erica, Angela? Um, sorry, the sun is shining in a funny way, so. Um, I, there's so many things I want to say, Ms. Sherry. That's a great question. I don't have orders or advice for anybody, but I do think I remembered back to when the, um, assistant superintendent of California public schools came to visit Oakland community school. And he spent the whole day there and he came in thinking, and he said to me, you know, he, he was embarrassed. And I said, why? He said, because I thought I was coming to a storefront school, mm -hmm. but this is the real deal. And I said, won't you go back and tell the people that you work with, tell the superintendent and your colleagues, they can do some of this in the existing school districts because you see everyone we had a relationship with oakland unified school district berkeley unified school district san francisco unified school district and also i believe hayward and san leandro because we didn't dislike the public schools that was where the majority of our children were we were a model for doing it different and pieces of the school or the whole thing could be replicated. He did, he went back and he actually called me after doing what I asked him to do. And he said, I was told we're not ready yet. I wasn't mm. surprised, but I'm, I'm, I, I guess all I wanna say is people get ready. How much more of screaming girls do we need, you know, we need to clog the cradle to prison pipeline. And
And the way to do it is with love. That's what I remember of Oakland Community School. Through that experience, I learned to love all kinds of parts of myself, not just the children. And so thank you for asking. I'll follow up. I'll follow up. Um, and also thank you for asking that question. Um, in 1977 of August, the California State Legislature presented a commendation to the Open Community School. And I think part of the language was about, you know, congratulating them, commending them for their success in um, teaching the children who were considered uneducable. Well, the Open Community School didn't consider any child uneducable. And I think that's a foundation. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a mentality. Um, they didn't uh, put labels on children. Um, they loved all children the same. And that came across. And one of the things that people say often in the interviews that I do um, is that Oakland Community School, the building and the people there were, was a place where they felt safe. Children need to feel safe. Um, we all need to feel safe in order for us to be open to exploring, to questioning, to growing, to, to searching inside ourselves. We need to feel like it's a safe space. And that's one of the things I think we need to think about when we're expecting our children to go sit in classrooms feeling unsafe but still expect them to learn and to perform and to take this test and you know do well. There, there's, there's some things that are just kind of basic, love, safety, um, you know, having enough food, not being hungry, not, you know, like having people that care about you, I think matters a lot. Um, and I think I'll, I'll go back to one of the mottos or a couple of the mottos from OCS, teach children how to think and not what to think. You know, move away from trying to make every child the same and know the same basic information and grading them if they don't or praising and, and you know, praising them if they do well, but the children who might not, who might need more help in a certain area, like categorizing them as less smart than or less that that just does all kinds of damage um, in so many ways. And then the other motto that I think is just so important is each one teach one. And that's been one of those African-American sayings from back in you know slavery days when one person would learn how to read or do something, they teach the next. And so I don't think there's one approach to dealing with where we are. And, but I think we need to start, like Erica said, people get ready. We all contain all kinds of skills that if we bring them together collectively and collaboratively, we can make things better. But we have to be at that point where the goal is centering the child and the child's needs. We have to take ego out of it. It's about the children. And I think once we shift our gaze to the children and the children's needs, that allows us to, to take it to that next level of conversation and work. It's work. And like Carol suggests, we just have to do it because it needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's amazing that uh, Asali, Erica, and Angela just conceptualized what I was thinking in my head, which is build, building community in the classroom. I mean, that's, that's, that's what we felt, you know, there, there's, there's just building community in the classroom, I think is, is that's, that's what we're talking about. So that's, if I could impart with some wisdom, it, it's that. 
And, you know, I don't know how you define that, but I know what it felt like as a, you know, as a, as a child and what that looks like. And that's, and it has to be real. Um, but I feel like that's, that's, that's our, you know, holy grail, if you will, to build that community within your classroom. Um, I'd like to just say one one last thing um, that um, came to me as I was listening to everybody um, talk. You know, like I said, I'm a substitute teacher. Am, am I be? Can you hear me? Am I talking? Okay. Like I said, I was a, a sub, I am or was a substitute teacher. Classrooms are large extremely large, to, in my opinion, you know, and um, you have to be a, an actress, actor, you have to be uh, patient, a lot of stuff, but I think that the classroom should be smaller, and what Gregory had said earlier about um, you were put in the classroom at where you're, everybody at the same level was in that classroom, and that's what is, I think, is a mistake in the public schools. Various levels are in there and various uh, energies are in there based on those levels. And I'll give you one example. There was, a, there was six years old and there was uh, in this classroom, this one little girl, she was very, very smart and one little black girl. And she was very, very smart and um, just cute as she wanted to be. And apparently she's, she had a lot of good stuff going on at home. And there was another little girl that had, that was um, challenged, not just because she hadn't been in school at a certain time, but you know, something from birth. And she was challenged. And I think they were trying to mainstream her, what they call mainstream her. But she would make it difficult for the teacher, like let's say lining up to go outside, she would make it difficult for the teacher because now the teacher has to give all her focus on this child and the rest of the class is being neglected. So one time before this, before this incident and the line happened, the little uh, black girl that I had, uh, she sort of kind of gravitated to me and she used to kind of act up, you know, cause I think she would get bored. And uh, I told her, I pulled her to the side one time and I said, I told her, I told her how beautiful she was and that actually because she was so smart, I saw her character, her trait, and that she was a leader because she could get kids to follow her, um, you know, just naturally, you know. And so I came back into that classroom uh, as a helper because the uh, uh, the teacher didn't have her credential yet and I had my credential. So I came back into the classroom another day and once it, they were in line and this little girl that was challenged, she just was going off and making it really difficult for the teacher to talk or to deal with her and deal with the whole class. And before I could even step up and try and do anything, this little girl that, this little black girl that I was telling you about, she stepped up and she went over to that little girl and she said, don't worry about it, I have her. This is a six year old telling me, don't worry about it, I'll take care of her. And she went over there and put her arm around that girl and I don't know what she said, but that girl calmed down and they, the teacher was able to carry on. I, I, I can't even talk, I can't even sum that up. You know, that was just, that's just so beautiful. We need to lower our classroom sizes. We need to uh, deal with the various uh, uh, thinking levels. So that's a whole restructuring of how to do classes in, in, you know, first grade, second grade, third grade. It's a whole nother structure that has to take place, that has to come in and take place. And that little girl in that place is a good example. You know, she wound up being the teacher's help, helper. What was I in there for, you know? Well, you were in there in order to help her. Yes. Teach one, exactly. teach one. Exactly. So yeah. there you go, wonderful. there you go, that, look at you. Look at you. <laughs> that you're right. wonderful that you were in this class. Right. 
I really want to thank one. each and every one of you for this panel and presentation tonight. Um, wonderful hearing from each of you. Um, it's been wonderful digging into outside of this panel, into your bios, into the work that you've done, into the many creative projects that each of you um, has done. And I really invite um, all our participants to do take a moment to read, the, read those bios and to just dig into some of the uh, just really wide range of projects that you guys have done. Uh, there's so much in there for us to learn from. Um, so, but before we leave, I do want to make a note. Um, I think there's a survey link that they are posting into the chat um, that we're inviting participants to complete. Um, we also hope that you will join us for part two of Black Radical Pedagogy on Wednesday, November 3rd, 6 p.m., same time, on Zoom also, um, for a conversation with a group of Black women who have made important contributions to the educational landscape of Chicago through their work in radical teaching, leadership, and organizing. Details and registration information in the chat. So that is also there. Thank you guys so much to our participants for staying with us. Um, I know I was happy to stay this little bit of extra time because your stories are just wonderful. Looking forward to that documentary when it comes out um, so that we can continue this learning journey. So. Thank you so very much. Oh, and thank, thank you, you so much to our organizers for this event. Power to the people. Right on, power to the people. Thank you, yes. thank you very much.